Ever since I was a little kid, people have asked me why I don't go to church. And I tell them it's because whenever I do go to church, I always catch the guy behind the podium lying to the audience. And it always irritates me that I have to sit and listen to that, knowing I can prove him wrong to everyone's satisfaction on every single point, but that I'll never get the chance. A year or so ago, I thought I might have that chance when I was invited to a small neighborhood church to participate in a seminar on creationism. They left a flyer on my door, not knowing who I was, and I couldn't have predicted what a surreal debacle would result. Once the presentation was over and I began to point out just a few of the dozens of outright lies that were in it, the audience reacted with outrage, trying to shut me up because they paid to hear these lies and did not even want to know what the truth really was. The discussion that followed was a disorienting descent into madness, which I would rather not repeat. But on Thursday, November 18th, 2010, I went into a church again. This one was quite a bit different because it was a mega church with a 7,000 seat indoor stadium and lots of media coverage for Christopher Hitchens' debate with William Dembski. This was interesting because they had bust in kids from all the Christian schools in the surrounding area. I had to wonder why would they do that since their usual habit is to ignore evidence, deny reality, and censor the expression of critical thinkers to be misrepresented later. To my experience, this event seemed entirely out of character for Christians, especially in Texas. Uh, but when all that's said and done, that'll be about an hour and 45 minutes. Uh, and that'll be enough time, I think, to get out both of these particular uh, views, uh, both of these particular statements. And I think at the end of that, uh, you'll walk away with some stuff to think about, um, some stuff to be challenged with, uh, and some questions that you might have. And uh, we hope that you take those questions uh, and you search for the answer and you search for the truth. And uh, that would be our great hope, is that you leave here saying, you know what, I need to go find the truth. Um, what, did, what, what somebody said about a particular statement, I want to go see if that's true or not. Never have I heard a religious proponent sound so objective or reasonable. I wondered, how can this be? Uh, the debate doesn't end here. Uh, this is where it starts. So go home. Um, Prestonwood is a great uh, church home if you don't have one and you want to find a place that uh, uh, searches for the truth with you, um, using scripture as our guide. That's when I figured it out. They are not permitted to search for the truth beyond the confines of their belief system. So that if that belief is wrong, then the truth will never be found there, and they will never admit that it isn't there, nor can they look beyond their dogma to find out where the truth really is. That's why faith is inherently dishonest. One who actually cares about truth, regardless what it turns out to be, would not limit his parameters the way these people do. But that's why this event is being hosted by a biblical worldview director. In the prologue of this video, he explains that their mission is not to evaluate opposing perspectives with an open mind, but rather to find strategies to counteract them without consideration. One of the reasons that we uh, have uh, debates like this is to actually provide uh, training for our students. And uh, Caleb and I were talking about this a little bit earlier. Uh, Caleb's dad is actually our football coach as well. And uh, we were just talking about the importance of actually practicing uh, before the big game. And Caleb's a senior and he's going to be at college next year. And we were talking about the importance um, of actually having those practices uh, before he goes out into the world uh, so that we have those, uh, those practices here on our campus. And so, Caleb, tell us a little bit about how important it is to practice uh, and listen to the other worldviews before you actually go out into the society and engage them? Well, uh, I mean, it is a lot like football. And for any of you students out there uh, that do play football or have played football, um, you know, you don't go into a game blind. You have to, uh, first of all, you've got to watch film. You've got to be educated on what the other team or the opposing view would, uh, would do and uh, just their schemes and um, uh, the way they do things. And uh, obviously you practice throughout the week before a game. And uh, that's much like this debate, you know, we're getting, we're getting practice and uh, just different, um, different schemes of our own to uh, be able to uh, counteract those other, the other teams or the other uh, opposing worldviews. Actually, the reason there should be debates like this is because either side might be right in whole or in part, or they might have valuable information in any event. And of course, if they do, then we would want to know that so that we can either make up our minds or change them accordingly once we've heard and understood what their arguments are. At least that is the perspective of one who values truth more than anything else. That is obviously not the position of one who has no desire to learn and understand, but has instead a need to believe and is determined to further that belief regardless whether it is true to any degree or not. Notice that this debate has not even begun yet, and those hosting it have already rejected all of their guests' arguments unheard. It is literally a game for them, having nothing to do with any search for truth beyond the boundaries of their presupposition. 
so that no matter what evidence Mr. Hitchens presents, it will be disregarded and discredited automatically. The students in this audience will be coached in their classrooms to reject it all, as their parents already have, according to the restrictions imposed by their ongoing indoctrination. Now, I'm not going to comment too much on the particulars of this debate. Another YouTuber by the name of Great Big Boar has already done a fine job of that, and there is no need for me to repeat what he has already said. But there are just a few points I feel compelled to comment on myself because I was there and there were a couple of differences between watching this video and seeing it live. For example, remember that those of us who attended the debate did not see the prologue with Dan and Caleb. Also, there seems to have been a problem with the recorded audio during my favorite moment of the debate. Specified complexity. In the design inference, I showed how this method applies outside biology. By the way, when I did this outside biology, I was in good shape. People were writing all sorts of nice things about my work. Once I applied it in biology, though, uh, my career went down the toilet and I can no longer get a job in the mainstream academic world. Um, and you can, you can actually look at this. Uh, I mean, there are wonderful endorsements on the back of, this, this, of my book. This is what it sounded like sitting in the live audience. Uh, my career went down the toilet and I can no longer get a job in the mainstream academic world. Uh, and you can, you can actually look at this. Uh, I mean, there are wonderful endorsements on the back of this, this of my book, uh, which have been pulled in the paperback edition. And in fact, one of the best... Somehow, audience applause can be easily heard at every other time during this debate. Also, watching them live, I remember thinking that Dembski seemed unusually sincere for a creationist, there being only a handful of lies which stood out in my mind at the time. I also initially thought that Hitchens only did an adequate job, although still better than I could have done considering the range of topics he brought up. Reviewing the debate again, however, I noticed that Dembski did much worse and Hitchens much better than I had originally thought. My only complaint with Hitchens was one point when he referred to the horrors of the Old Testament. Only a few verses later than the Ten Commandments, uh, God instructs the children of Israel to kill everyone of the other tribe, the Amalekites, the Midianites, everybody, all the men, all the children, and to leave only the marriageable women alive. That's a, that is, um, and that's a re an instruction that's very frequently repeated, by the way, and invariably carried out. I would correct Hitchens only on this one point, for the Bible has Moses, God's own prophet and alleged author, ordering his troops to murder every man, woman, and animal, and to pillage and destroy all their homes. But the only people permitted to survive were not marriageable women. They were described in the Bible as female children. In Jewish tradition, the distinction between adults and children is marked with a mitzvah at age 13. So Moses demanded that his men preserve only preteen girls, and all that that implies, with their mothers and baby brothers horribly butchered right in front of them, and these little girls were only allowed to live after their captors determined whether or not they were virgins. Think about that for a moment. Despite the fact that the audience of this debate included busloads of schoolgirls in tartan skirts, it still would have been wise of Hitchens to point out that Hebrew tradition at that time permitted what would today be considered the sexual molestation of prepubescent children, as well as other atrocities like genocide and even abortion, all with God's full support in each case. It would have been wise of Hitchens to note this because Dembski would certainly try to argue the reverse. If we don't see ourselves as made in God's image, as exceptional, not in a prideful sense, but exceptional in the sense that we are made in God's image, then, that humans have a special place in the scheme of things, then I think you do very easily run into eugenics, euthanasia, abortion, things like that. So it is a significant point. And that's why Hitchens should have shown that the people in the Bible ran very easily into all of these things constantly, even though they all saw themselves as God's chosen people and created in his image. In fact, God was the one commanding most of these crimes. That's significant when you remember that the point of this debate was whether a good God exists. Failing every challenge to that end, Bill Dembski tried to argue that a secular perspective offers no explanation for objective morality, even though our evolution as societal animals is exactly that, and obviously demands such a standard where Bill's religion, ironically, does not. Hitchens did point that out, though not as boldly as I would have liked, and Dembski couldn't defend his allegation without contradicting himself. In terms of God's goodness, it seems either we are going to have to admit that God is the standard because everything follows from him, or 
we're going to have to rever- refer the goodness to some subjective standard of some creature, but that God himself is not going to be bound by that. That cannot be the standard of goodness. You need to pay close attention here. Nature, which is nuts and bolts reality for the atheist, has no values and thus can offer no grounding for good and evil. Values on the atheist view are subjective and contingent. They reflect inclinations to behave and feel in certain ways given the conditions of survival and reproduction under which our ancestors evolved and the social conditions under which we've been reared. Hitchens, for instance, is incensed with religious communities that practice female genital mutilation. So am I. But religious communities that engage in this practice are quite content to continue it. But without an objective moral standard, religious communities that engage in this practice are quite content to continue it. Uh, But the thing is, the Jews also turned against themselves. They probably fought as much against themselves as they fought against other people, and sometimes in, in divine judgment. Morality or ethics is illusory inasmuch as it persuades us that it has an objective reference. That's the punchline. See, for morality to work, it has to convince us that there's an objective reference. Because if we realize that it's just bunk, then we're not going to do it. We have to be deluded into thinking that there is an objective moral standard to which we have to bow down. And as long as we're deluded in that way, then we can be moral. But if we don't act responsibly to one another, whether for altruistic reasons or not, the motives don't necessarily have to be pure. But if we didn't have a social dimension, a bonding one, uh, we wouldn't survive. We'd have gone by now. We wouldn't have made it out of Africa. The question, in a sense, answers itself. That evolution has uh, given us some sort of group solidarity, makes us bond, and that this, uh, that this helps preserve the, the species. So, it's, uh, uh, so it all kind of matches up. And you know, I think, I think there's, uh, you can get that from evolution. I, I don't think you need to get it exclusively from evolution. I think certainly one can argue on basis of design that God has designed us to be social creatures. But without an objective moral standard, religious people confident that theirs is the only way to build a better world have felt it their moral duty to coerce, torture, and kill others. Non-religious people can behave well also. You know, the thing is, I applaud probably 80, 90 percent of his book, the, 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 the hypocrisies, the problems that he finds. I mean, the, the topic of the debate was the existence and goodness of God. I mean, we, we weren't talking about Christian theism, but I mean, I think uh, here we are at, obviously, a, a Christian church. So let's talk a little bit about this. In God becoming human in Jesus Christ, that God has established solidarity with the human condition. Uh, this was actually, in my own conversion, the thing that was the turning point. I mean, I was raised in a largely secular home, a uh, biologist father who taught evolutionary biology. Yeah, I, I was raised a Roman Catholic. I had no belief that Jesus was God. I was forced to go to church, and the Catholic priest saying, you cannot be a Christian unless you believe that Jesus was God. And I remember consciously thinking, I don't believe this. You know? And when I was uh, started at the University of Chicago at age 16, I was asked what my religious preference was. I put down Hindu. Because I was, a, I was basically a New Age guy. That's, that's, that's what I was thinking. But none of those, none of that, uh, the, the, the sense I always had that was God was distant, and at best he knew what I was dealing with by description, by knowing, by kind of reading a book out of it, by looking from his heaven and seeing what I was, seeing what I was going through from a distance. I thought your God was supposed to be omniscient, Bill. Do you know what that means? And let's not forget that, unlike Jesus, the Hindu god Krishna claimed to have created the universe himself, and that he came to earth in human form as an avatar of a triune god many centuries before Jesus' time, and that he performed many miracles, including giving sight to the blind, and that he died and was resurrected and his body vanished while he lives on and maintains a personal relationship with hundreds of millions of devotees today. So if you were ever a Hindu, why convert to Christianity? What could Jesus do that Krishna had not already done? 